Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Zechariah chapter 1. I will be reading there shortly. Zechariah chapter 1, verses 18 to the end of the chapter. Now, I strongly believe in expository preaching, going through books of the Bible, um, preaching through various books of the Bible, and every once in a while you hit a passage that is, sounds very bizarre or it's difficult to understand, uh, but this is the beauty of expository preaching, because we come to those places and we learn about them and we grow, um, and we meet some difficult things, but we will see this uh, here in this passage when I read it. Uh, however, I do think it is a happy providence uh, that we have come to this part of Zechariah's vision on a day when we have a baby dedication ceremony and also communion. Uh, hopefully, as we travel through this, uh, you will understand why. You might not understand at first, but I hope you will in due time. And I am need to do this here. So Zechariah chapter 1, uh, verses 18 to 21. <clears throat> and I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these? And he said to me, there are, These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, What are these coming to do? He said, These are the horns that scattered Judah, so that no one raised his head. And these have come to terrify them, to cast down the horns of the nations who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter it. Let's pray and ask God's blessing on his word. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that it nourishes us and strengthens us when we hear it proclaimed or when we read it on our own. And Lord, I pray that you will plant this word into our hearts and we will see that you take that which is weak to shame the strong and that it is you who do these things. And so Lord, we commit our time into your hands and ask for your Holy Spirit to speak through me to these your people. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Now, quite a number of years ago, I heard a story uh, by a man named Tony Campolo, and it went something like this. He was at an all-boys camp of junior high boys. He was the director, and he said that this group of boys were unruly, and there was one boy among them that had a stutter, and he limped as he walked. And these junior high boys were ruthless to him. They, they picked on him, they made fun of him, as junior, boys, junior high boys sometimes do. Well, at the very end of the week of camp, he said that each cabin had to pick a, one of the boys to come up and say what camp meant to them. And so the boys in this camp took this boy who stuttered and limped and had him go up there. And when Tony heard this, he was furious. He was livid. And so the day came, and the, all the, the other campers came up and said their thing, and then it was his turn. And this boy stood up, and he limped. He dragged himself up to the podium, and he began saying, j j j j j j j and he eventually said, Jesus loves me. Tony said it took him about five, maybe ten minutes to get out a simple sentence, Jesus loved me. And he said that it was, there was a dead silence in the whole auditorium. And he looked behind him and he saw tears in the eyes of these junior high boys. And he said, we brought in professional baseball players 
to these kids that told their testimonies. Nothing would get to them. And who did God use but a junior high boy who could barely even speak to say a very simple sentence, and that got through to those boys. And God takes that which is weak and uses that against the strong, to shame the strong, as the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians. The Lord does this over and over and over again in the scriptures. He takes Abraham, who was whose wife was barren, to be the heir, heir of all the nations, to bless all the nations. He took David, a shepherd boy, to become king. The Lord does this over and over again. And we see the same theme in this passage of scripture that I just read this morning. The past couple of weeks, we looked at the first vision of Zechariah with its imagery of the rider and its red horse. And we learned two vital lessons from that. Namely, the Lord knows the condition of the earth and of his people. And the Lord is jealous for his people with a jealous love. And now we come to this as this the first vision fades in the background. Another vision fills his mind. It is a vision that teaches us two main points. And the first point is this, that the powers of the world scatter and oppress the people of God. The powers of the world scatter and oppress the people of God. That's not a very encouraging thought this morning, but hang with me for a while. In place of the rider and its horse, this vision fills Zechariah's mind. Four horns suddenly appear as we read in verse 18. And I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. We might immediately ask a mom with Zechariah, what are these? What are these? And the angel who spoke with him says in verse 19, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And we note again in verse 21 that they are described as the horns of the nations who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter it. Well, what are these horns? They represent world powers. Why do I say this? Throughout the Old Testament, the horns signified strength or power. The horn on any animal is its focused strength. It is a, uh, the symbol of a horn came to mean thus power or strength or influence. For example, the other of Psalm 92 said, but you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. In other words, you, God, exalted my strength or my power or my influence. And second, and very particular here, the, these horns refer to the nations. We see this in verse 21, that they are horns of the nations. They represent the powers of the nations. They are thus world powers. The metaphor or symbol of a horn oftentimes represented political or military strength or power. And if you read through the book of Daniel, you will understand that um, as Daniel and even the book of Revelation has beasts with horns. That is its strength, that is its power. And we note that there are four horns here. And last week, we noted that there were four groups of horses. Well, some want to interpret this as various kingdoms. I take it as a more comprehensive thing, that it is from the four points of the compass, from the enemies of Israel from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west. And this is how I take it. And they come from all corners of the world to scatter and oppress the people of God. Now clearly the immediate application of this described both the Assyrians who scattered the northern, northern Israel in 722 BC and the Babylonians who took captive and exiled the southern nation of Judah and its people in 586 BC. Now, in our day and age, the people of God are not a political entity. And thus, I want to suggest to you that these world powers that are against God's people today extend beyond the natural borders to the ideologies of today. True, there are some places like North Korea or China or some Muslim countries that do oppress the people of God. 
But for us here in 21st century America, we deal with other world powers, the ideologies, the ideals or forces that are against Christianity today. We would call them worldviews, perhaps. Let us unmask a few of them for you. One, the self-culture. This is rampant narcissism. This focuses on the self. In other words, the self-culture says, everything in the world exists for me and my purpose. I am the sun and everything else orbits around me. This is what the self-culture tells us. And from, these, from this stems many other dangerous ideals and beliefs. Or two, rugged independent individualism. While independence and individualism are good in some ways, this takes it too far. It says, I do not need anyone else. I can survive and live by myself. I don't need you. That's what it says. Or relativism that says, I'll believe what I want to believe and you believe what you want to believe. There is no objective truth, which is kind of strange because you are making an objective truth statement. Or the gender confusion powers that seduce more and more each day, which is also rampant in our society. Or the woke theory that claims to be aware of the social, political environments regarding all demographics and socio-economic standings. However, this fights against systems of indoctr indoctrination, such as religion, education systems, and so on. This is the whole theory, and there are many more of these, but these are a handful of them, and they are promoted by the media, media power brokers, the movie directors, the news anchors, those who shape the world with their power and influence. And this is the world powers that we have to deal with here in the United States of America. And these world powers scatter God's people. We saw this in the text this morning. And this word scatter has the nuance of winnowing when they take the grain, when they take the wheat, and they thrash it, and the chaff goes up in the air, and the wind blows it away. That is the scattering. We know what that means. If you've had children before, you know that some mornings you wake up, and there are toys scattered all over the living room floor. What happened? The children came and scattered them. This is what happens if you've had children or if, or if a vase, vase falls to the ground and shatters, and the pieces go everywhere. We know what scatter means, and horns, by their very nature, scatter. If you've ever been, or if you've ever seen two rams butt heads, that's the nature of horns. They, they attack each other, and they, the horns drive away the other animals in the herd, the, the other male animals. They scatter. And the scattering is not kind of like a, a, a scattering of toys, per se. It's more like what the Hurricane, hurricane Ian did uh, recently and scattered boats and everything else all over Florida. This is the nature of the horns. And so these world powers scatter God's people far and wide. The Assyrians deported the northern tribes and dispersed them among the nations. The Babylonians exiled the people into Babylon, into Babylon. And so these world powers seek to scatter, and this happens today. You look at the rugged independent individualism, and it will tell you you do not need anyone else. Therefore, you don't need to go to church. I go to church. I can do it myself. In fact, I can stay home, and I can, I can look on the internet to find my, famous, the, my favorite preacher. I can listen to worship music. I don't need to go to church. I, I can do it on my own. It goes even further and says, I don't even need Jesus. This is what the rugged, independent individualism will eventually tell you, that you don't even need God to help you out. Or take the self-culture that seeks, that focuses in on the self. Here again, it shouts in your ears, find, find a church that suits you. Go, you know, it's all about you. And so if the preacher is too boring, or if the music is, is too, too dull, or whatever it might be, or too loud, you just go, go find another church. Find one that suits you. But God says, no, that's not it. These powers of the world also seek to oppress God's people. We see again in verse 21 the description of the horns. These are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one raised his head. This meant that the people of God were oppressed. 
They hung their heads in shame because of what the enemy has done towards them. They were bound in oppression and subjection to the extent that they could not lift up their heads. And the people who experienced the exile saw and heard of the destruction of their city, faced the cruel oppression from their enemies, and endured the long, arduous years away from their homeland. They were discouraged, they were depressed, because they were oppressed. And the powers of the world oppress the people of God to the point sometimes that they do not lift up their heads. Rampant persecution in nations such as North Korea or the heavy surveillance system used in China to keep watch on the people remind us that there are still world powers in the form of nations that do oppress the people of God. We might think that we are free of this, but there's another oppression that we might not think about. It is the oppression of godless society on the souls of believers. This is described in 2 Peter chapter 2. Abraham's nephew Lot moved to Sodom, and Peter describes him as greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless, over their lawless deeds and that he saw and heard. And we feel this more than we realize. Our souls are greatly distressed by the things we see and hear, whether it's on the TV or the news or the internet. We do not have to look beyond our cell phones, in fact, to see the central conduct of the wicked and the numerous lawless deeds that are taking place in our day and age. And in this way, the powers of the world oppress the people of God. And if anyone dares to raise his head and stand up, he suddenly becomes a target for the world powers. Well, horns on an animal both scatter and oppress those weaker than them. Well, what do we do about these world powers? How can we confront the, them that scatter us and oppress us? Is there any hope for us? Well, yes, there is, but it's not in the form that we would expect. What is God's antidote to this? And this is the second major point of the vision. It is a craftsman of the Lord. The craftsman of the Lord. After Zechariah sees these four terrible horns that scatter God's people, the Lord then shows him the remedy of the world powers. And we read in verse 20, Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. Zechariah does not ask what these are. He asks instead, what are these coming to do? And the answer is found in verse 21. These have come to terrify them, to cast down the horns of the nations, who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter it. These craftsmen are the antidote to the world powers. They are to do what the horns usually do, and that is to terrify and cast down. Well, if that is the case, we might well ask, well, who are these craftsmen? Now, some scholars think that they are other nations that come in and take over the horns, and they themselves become horns necessarily agree with that. Some think of them as, as these muscular men with huge hammers to crash these horns. But the word craftsman is a much more humble term. It means one who builds with his hands, one like a carpenter or a stone mason. And this, com this is a common use of the word. And these are the people who constructed the tabernacle in the days of Moses and constructed the temple in the days of Solomon. And these also are those who rebuilt the temple at various times through the history, especially in the days of Zechariah. They were craftsmen who came and rebuilt the temple of the Lord. And here in this vision of Zechariah, the overarching vision that spans chapters 1 to 6, you might recall from last week, one of the promises of God to his people is that my house shall be built in Jerusalem. And so, it seems fitting that in this next vision, what does Zechariah see? If the promise was that God's house, God's temple was going to be built, it would seem fitting then that the next vision shows craftsmen coming 
to build it. And they are humble people. They are not rulers. They are not military leaders or generals or commanders. They are not scholars. They work with their hands. Many of you, I'm sure, have known what that's like. Well, how can these craftsmen destroy these world powers? And the answer is that it's not within them, but it's in what they are building. They have come to build the temple of God. And in so doing, they obey God and thus establish God's rule in the world. As they rebuild the temple brick by brick, they establish God's rule in the city and in the world. They were simply the ones God has chosen to rebuild his temple and his influence in the world. And we note that there are four of them equal to the task of the four horns, the four world powers. So you might be sitting there scratching your head and saying, okay, that was really interesting, but what in the world does this have to do with me here today? Well, we are not called to build a temple per se. But let's bring this down to everyday life. We, as the church, are called to make disciples of all nations. We are called to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. We are called to establish his kingdom here on earth. And how might, how does God do this? Does God call world leaders or politicians or scholars to do this? Well, he might and he sometimes does. But, and here's the great news for us, God chooses to use everyday believers like you and me to accomplish his purposes in the world and thus destroy the world powers. Now, let me give some examples about this. Do you understand that you, as fellow believers, have a vital part to play in the kingdom of God? Consider that as you go into your closet and pray, your kingdom come, Lord. You are establishing God's kingdom first in your heart and then in the world around you. <clears throat> Consider that when you grow in your own holiness and godliness, in some way, you are hastening the day of God. Our small choices in holiness and godly living actually matter more than we think they do. Each time we refuse to sin and say yes to God and His ways, we establish the kingdom of God. Christians are the craftsmen and craftswomen of the Lord that shape the culture they are in by the way we live our lives and the way we speak. Okay, let's start going in a little bit. Husbands, when you love your wives as Christ loved the church and remain faithful to her, this terrifies and casts down the world powers that divide marriage. There is nothing glamorous or seemingly powerful when a husband picks up the mantle of servanthood and says, hey honey, can I wash the dishes for you? There's nothing powerful in that, nothing glamorous. But when God looks at that, he's saying, I am establishing my kingdom in that marriage. And husbands, there's, there's no apparent power when, when, a, when a husband dies to himself and turns off the TV and then listens to his wife who is speaking to, her, to him. There's no great power in that. But again, it establishes God's kingdom. And you are declaring, God's way is better, and I'm going to do that. Likewise, wives, I can't leave you guys off the hook either. As you respect and submit to your husbands, you tear down the world powers of feminism that rejects authority and defines families. The Apostle Peter said, likewise, wives, submit, be submissive to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct. It's 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2. In this way you establish the kingdom of God in your marriage. Over the past few months, we've had two couples in this congregation that have celebrated more than 50 years of marriage. One of them more than 60 years of marriage. We applaud.
have those types of things because those marriages say to the world powers, hey, our marriage last, we followed God, and our marriage stood the test. Isn't that wonderful? Now, this morning we had a baby dedication for Xander. When a father and mother invest in the lives of their children and train their children in the ways of the Lord, they lay a kingdom of God brick in the child's heart. Now, sometimes those of you with children know this. There's a daily crying. There's a waking up and you, you hear crying. There's, there's days when you're wondering, like, I've done everything I can. I have no idea what to do anymore. And you lack the wisdom, it seems. Yet when we choose to instruct our children in God's ways and discipline them in love and love them in various ways, we are tearing down the world powers that seek their hearts. It's a daunting task to raise a child in the ways of the Lord, but it is a task God has called us to. Parents are the craftsmen who build the hearts of their children one brick at a time. I was reading in this book, Resolution, that I mentioned a little bit earlier, and there was a point, and it said, Brooks Adam, the son of Charles Adams, a U.S. ambassador to Great Britain under the Lincoln administration, he was only eight years old, and his father took him fishing, and this eight-year-old boy went home and wrote in his diary, I went fishing with my dad. What a glorious day! Little did he know that his father also wrote in his diary, his journal, and he said, went fishing with my son. What a wasted day. That father did not get it. That father failed to see that those small acts of, of investing in our children, whether it's something so incredibly simple, can be so incredibly powerful in a child's life. Let's move beyond our family to our neighbors. Whenever we show kindness to our neighbors and seek to love our neighbors as ourselves, then we build the kingdom of God. There's nothing praiseworthy when you pick up sticks for your neighbor. There's nothing praiseworthy when you give a card to someone who is grieving or to visit them when they are sick. The world doesn't even glance at you, take notice of you. But in God's economy, you did it for Jesus. In God's economy, you are establishing the kingdom of God when you do that with your neighbors. When you bless those who persecute you and pray for those who harm you, then we tear down the world powers that promote hate and division. Again, let's, let's move on. When we choose to gather together at church to worship God and to hear His word preached, then we invest in the kingdom of God. When we choose to attend church as opposed to going to a sports event or to doing church on your own, then we declare to the world God's way matters. Now, Christopher Ash in his book, Remaking a Broken World, says something startling. He says, the, local, the ordinary local church, with all its imperfections, weaknesses, oddities, and problems, has within it the seeds, the spiritual and relational genetic blueprint of a broken world remade. The church is God's antidote to remake a broken world. And so, when we come and we hear the word of God proclaimed, when we proclaim the gospel, because the church is that, because the gospel is proclaimed, when we do this, we are investing and in rebuilding the kingdom of God and establishing it here in this community, here in our hearts, in our families. Furthermore, when we share the gospel to somebody, that sometimes is foolishness to that person. 1 Corinthians 1.23, Paul says, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and folly to the Gentiles. Yet even though it might be folly to the Gentiles, it might seem foolishness to them. When we share the gospel, it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. God is establishing his kingdom when we do so. And we say, Amen. All of these things, and there are many more, they seem insignificant. And in the world's eyes, they are. But in God's eyes, even the smallest act, the act of giving a cup of cold water to a child, is huge 
in God's economy, in God's kingdom. We cannot over or underestimate that. These small acts of obedience established his kingdom and rule in the world, and brick by brick the temple was built, day by day, one prayer at a time, one godly choice at a time, one act of love no matter how small. We participate in God's building program to establish his kingdom here on earth. As Glenn Pratt, and he's not here, oftentimes says, we are your boots on the ground. We are his ambassadors. And no matter what little corner of the world you may be in, you are God's ambassador to be in that place, to shine the light and be the salt there. Now, it is perhaps not surprising that this word craftsman is also applied to our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same word in the original languages that describe him as a carpenter. When he came home to Nazareth and taught in the synagogue, the people who heard him said, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How, much, how are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter or the craftsman, the son of Mary? Our Lord Jesus, though he was king of kings, became a humble carpenter, ordinary carpenter. The world took no notice of him, yet through his humble obedience and death on the cross, he overcame the world powers, and he comes to us and bids us to come and to die with him. And as we come to communion this morning, let us focus on our Lord Jesus, who though rich became poor so that he might make many rich, and though king of kings became the suffering servant and bore our sin upon himself on the cross. He is the ultimate craftsman who established God's kingdom through his death and resurrection, and he is the one who tears down the world powers. So let us pray and then go to communion. Our Father in heaven, we thank you and that you are strong and you are mighty and nothing is too hard for you. And Lord, we are ordinary people, everyday people. We go to our everyday kinds of jobs and, and things that we do. We live in ordinary families. But Lord, you are able to use us to tear down these world powers. May it be so, Lord. And may we not grow weary in doing good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um.